Well, Psalm 19 is one of my favorite psalms. And, and I can actually say this. This is kind of, uh, I've thought about this earlier today. There are psalms that sometimes I'll get up and I'll say, like recently, I said, Psalms 118 is one of my favorite psalms. And it is. Psalms 118 is really one of my favorites, but it was not always one of my favorite psalms. Psalms 118 became one of my favorite psalms, probably, well, certainly within the last 10 years. But Psalm 19 has always been one of my favorite psalms. And, um, and the reason why I'm doing it here is because uh, I hadn't done it yet, and I thought that because I'll be going to Israel soon and sharing on the psalms, and I thought, which ones do I want to do? I thought, I want to do Psalm 19. So, so that's why you're here. <laughs> Because this is actually one of my favorite psalms. So, um, and you can see on the front before we read it, that God speaks through nature, and it looks like I messed up the, the writing there. He also speaks through his word. That's verses 7 through 11. I messed that up. He speaks through his word. So this is called, he, there's natural revelation and there's special revelation. The two ways that God speaks natural revelation, and special revelation. And with that in mind, let's read the psalm. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and he rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. You know, if there's one verse in that that's worth everybody memorizing, it's that last verse. Because what a prayer that last verse is. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord. I just wanted also just to point out, just because it's sometimes helpful to see it, you'll notice that the, uh, I highlighted in yellow verse 1 and verse 14, and there are 14 verses in this psalm, unless, of course, if you're reading it, for example, in the TLV, where there's 15 verses, and the reason for that is because the Hebrew Bible always counts the superscription as a verse. And so in the Hebrew Bible, verse 1 is, for the music director, a Psalm of David. And the TLV or the complete Jewish Bible will reflect that. And so that's why the verses will get off with English Bibles. Now, the th reason why I'm actually um, happy to do this Psalm tonight is because this Psalm is actually the Psalm of the day for Shavuot. And that's kind of cool, isn't it? So, um, and, and why would this be? Well, because the psalm does two things. It talks about God speaking through nature, and it talks about God speaking by his voice 
through his the special revelation. And that's Shavuot. On Shavuot, on Pentecost, God came down on a mountain and he spoke the Ten Commandments. And when he spoke the Ten Commandments, the top of the mountain was on fire and the ground shook. So the earth the ground, creation spoke at the same time as the voice of God was speaking. That's Shavuot, right? And so this is the psalm that is the psalm of the day for Shavuot. And tonight at sunset, it will be Shavuot. So that's kind of cool. So this is the psalm. Now, I always like to... Uh, to bring out Sonsino, just because it's it's a it's a not a big commentary, but I like it. It's 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 an orthodox commentary, and I and it's very Jewish. Obviously, it's not messianic, but still really good, <laughs> and I love it. So um, it says an abrupt change is noticeable at the end of verse seven, verse six in the English Bible. And the psalm falls into two clear divisions, and this next great outline is. Um, not significant, but the modern view is that the two compositions or two fragments have been joined into one psalm. You can tell I actually type all of this. That's why you see those <laughs> you see those quotes. I type it all. Okay. But the abruptness is rather an argument for than against unity. For a compiler would have been likely to try to make some sort of glue to hold the fragments together. While a poet, in the rush of his afflatus, would welcome the very abruptness which the manufacturer would avoid. Indeed, one part is incomplete without the other. And in combination, they point to the two sources of the knowledge of God which man possesses. The marvels of his creation as seen in the starry heavens and the divine character of the moral law. The philosopher Kant may well have been influenced by this psalm when he wrote, there are two things that fill my soul with holy reverence and ever-growing wonder. The spectacle of the starry sky that virtually annihilates us as physical beings and the moral law which raises us to infinite dignity as intelligent agents. And what caught my attention about when I read that is as I studied through the psalm, as I noticed that the Jewish commentary, Sansino, obviously refers to Kant, but so does Kinder's Christian commentary also notices that, the, that Kant probably got his thoughts from this psalm. So that's kind of interesting, and Kant is considered, according to Stanford, a central figure, if not the central figure in modern philosophy. So people are recognizing he got his thoughts from this psalm. That's kind of cool. So the first thing, God speaks through nature. And uh, in verses 2 and 3, it says, their voice goes out into all the ends of the earth, their words to the end of the world. That is quoted by Paul in Romans. In Romans 10, 18, their sound has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So the word there actually for voice or sound is actually a, a, refers to like a plumb stick or a line, like a measuring rod. It's almost like God is saying that nature has got these measuring rods out there. And they're there. And you can, you can think that you're going to avoid the reality of the law of gravity, but you step out the window and you're going to fall. And there are laws that God has put in creation. And you violate them at your own detriment. And they're just in creation. And nature speaks. Now, Paul will use this logic of the idea that God's word is just speaking through nature. He uses it in Romans 1. And this is a very timely concern the issue that Paul raises. Let me just read this section from Romans to you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. 
Because what may be known of God is manifest. Manifest means it's visible. What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Then we skip that. I skip down to verse just for space, skipping down to verse 24. Look at how he applies this. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women engaged, exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. You can see that what Paul is saying, he's actually talking actually about sexual perversion, and he's saying what they're doing is they're violating the obvious truths that are in nature. I mean, look what's happening in our world right now with women's sports, right? When you violate the obvious truths that are in nature. So Paul is using the same logic, basing his logic on this thought that is coming right out of Psalm 19. And this is actually, John Calvin is, along with Martin Luther, considered like the two most important people in the Protestant Reformation. John Calvin is famous for saying, all truth is God's truth. Right? So if it's true, it's true. Right? And so I I'm, know I'm, when we studied counseling, when I went to school for counseling, that was a, a line that was used all the time. All truth is God's truth. If it's true, it's a fact. Right? And the fact is, there's a sun in the sky. And the fact is, that, you know, I don't want to be too political here, but maybe it's okay. It's th what they're doing in women's sports is not okay. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not okay. You know, I've got, I've got a daughter and I've got granddaughters. And it's just, it's just not okay. It's violating. It's like you step out a window and you're going to fall. It's just, this is the logic here. So, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The Shemayim declare, they recount, declare, recount, or they rehearse something that is a long-established fact of something that has happened in the past. The heavens are declaring the facts and the way things have been for the untold eons and eons of time. But then it says the firmament shows his handiwork. The firmament, which is also the word in, you know, in the, uh, on the, on the, uh, God, on the second day, God created a firmament in the midst of the heavens to separate the waters from, uh, that were below the, uh, the firmament from the waters above the firmament. I said it backwards, but uh, to separate the waters. That's the firmament. Okay, that's on the second day. He's separating things there. And the, when the flood came, obviously what happened was the firmament broke because the moral boundaries of humanity, morality is tied to the physical world. You can't separate them. You can't separate the moral law from the rest of the law. Because all of it comes from one place, God. And when in Noah's day, when they violated the moral law, what happened was the firmament broke and the waters came down, but it also said the waters of the deep came up. When the moral boundary broke, the physical boundary broke. Does that make sense? That's what happened there. You can't violate truth 
it's just, you know, there's a, Dobson had this, um, the Truth Project. Y'all, anybody see that? And in like in the first lesson of that, the guy, the, the teacher makes the statement. He says, you drive up to this, this really well manicured um, facility and the lawn is beautiful and the building's beautiful and everything's just beautiful and you get out and you walk by this guy and he's got his hand in his shirt like, you know, his jacket like this and he says, I'm Napoleon. And you walk up to this next guy and, and he says, I'm Julius Caesar. And you walk up to this next guy and he says, I'm Jesus Christ. He says, where have you just arrived? And his answer is, you have arrived at an insane asylum. <laughs> because you have arrived at a place in which people are not connected with reality. <laughs> it's our world. <laughs> so the firmament is just, there are things, there are boundaries. And the firmament is announcing, it shows, this word, it means to show or to proclaim a new occurrence. So God is above the firmament, and then there's this firmament, and the firmament is showing what's coming out of the presence of God. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not going to do what's in these notes for the, on, starting on page four. For uh, just, I'll just tell you, the bottom of three and four. There's a bunch there on Ezekiel. In the Talmud, it actually warns not to study Ezekiel chapter 1. And I gave you the basic information there. It actually warns, that I gave you the, the, the short, the really small font on, on, the, on, verse, on page 4. Four people studied the Ezekiel 1. One of them um, went insane. The second one was a youngster. The Hebrew word means a person younger than 13. A person who had not yet been bar mitzvahed, who had not yet reached the age of accountability, and fire came out from the presence of God and killed him. This is obviously not true. The third one studied it, and um, he, w he went um, insane. So one goes insane, one gets killed, um, one... Oh, one become, the third one becomes a believer in Yeshua. He's crazy. <laughs> right? And the fourth one is Rabbi Akiva, who gets out with his life. And the reason why I'm giving you my, my studied opinion on this, the reason why the Talmud is warning Jewish people not to study Ezekiel 1 is because it is so obviously presenting God in human form. If you want to hear a sermon on that, I preached on that here on June 2nd, 2018. So four years ago, and there's the link. It's about how we are created in the image of God. It's a, it was the Shabbat service. Um, so Maimonides said that celestial bodies actually have intellect and knowledge so that they can praise God. And at first you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. But then you go... Well, why not? Why is it so crazy that in their own way, God could make everything so that everything has the power to praise God? Not so nutty. Now, one of the things that comes out of Psalm 19 is that it suggests um, something pretty close to astrology. Uh, Kidner's commentary says this, Psalm 19 glances at mythology and then turns to repudiate it. Okay. I tend to think he's making that statement because he's wanting to be careful. Because it does seem to come pretty close to astrology. What I would say about Psalm 19 is that it does this. It presents the stars the heavens, as actually presenting God. Okay, and I have two sermon links there that I, teachings that I did when Havdalah was online. 
So you could watch them there. The video number one, the stars proclaim Yeshua. And that sermon is really about the idea that for some reason, Jews in particular have been, always have been, and are today just as much as ever engaged in astrology. Extremely interested in astrology. So if you look up, like, anything to do with Kabod, ultra-Orthodox Judaism, and you start to looking into the calendar, 12 things you should know about the month of Nisan, and one of them will be what astrology sign is of that month. So it's really, it's a, so what is it about, ast why are Jews so interested in that? And part of my answer will be because they're so interested in anything that is spiritual. If, if there is a spiritual manifestation, Jews care. Okay, so pray for the sick. Somebody gets healed, Jews care. Okay, they care about signs. The second, um, the second part two of that is just, and it comes largely from that book by D. James Kennedy, who was a phenomenal preacher and the founder of Evangelism Explosion, clearly replacement theology, has nothing in the book about Israel that's unique, nothing about Israel. But he does show in a very good, very convincing way that the astrology world sign, whatever you want to call it, clearly preaches the gospel. Just It just points you right to Jesus. From the Virgin Mary to, the, to Leo the Lion, it's just the whole thing. Sagittarius, the two-natured being, God-man, the whole thing just points to Jesus. Okay, so that's the, so that's very different from saying something points to God than it is to say, I'm going to use it to guide my life. That's entirely different. And I think that what, what's, what Kidner did when he says it glances at mythology and repudiates it, I think it's fair to say this. This is the way I would say it. Psalms 19 is saying creation clearly points at God. Just cre I'm gonna say, creation clearly points at God. But let me tell you about the Word of God. Because the Word of God, it's going to, <laughs> the Word of God doesn't just point. It converts the soul. It makes the wise person. It makes wise out of the simple person. It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It endures forever. It, may, it is righteous altogether. It's more desirable than a lot of gold. In other words, it doesn't repudiate. It just says, the, yeah, creation does this, but that ain't, the, let me tell you what's really significant, the Word of God. You see the difference there? So I, would, I wouldn't use the word repudiate. I just think he's trying to be careful. The Bible is clear, though, that we are not to worship the heavens. Deuteronomy 4, verse 19. Take heed, lest you lift up your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the host of heaven, that's astrology. You feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven of heritage. Don't worship them. They're pointing to the one that you should worship. That's what they do. They point to the one you should worship. Now that you know him, he'll give you the direction. He'll give you the word for the year. <laughs> you don't need to go to the stars. Okay? Let them lead you to Jesus. Then you got it. Now, despite the fact that D. James Kennedy does not recognize the significance of Israel with regard to astrology, sure does look like there's something there in Genesis 37 that if, and let me say it this way, if the stars are going to preach Yeshua, why would it be a surprise that they would preach to the Jew first? You see the point? Why would that be a surprise? And actually, that's in that second sermon where I show how... Does, they really do preach to the Jew first. And one point, Genesis 37. Then Joseph dreamed another dream, told it to his brothers, and said, look, I've dreamed another dream. 
This time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his, now of course there are 11 brothers, he's the 12th. So he told it to his father and brothers. His father rebuked him, said, And what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers come down to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Clearly then the sun and the moon and the stars are, since Joseph is one of the stars, Joseph's father is Jacob, Jacob whose name is changed to Israel. So Israel and um, uh, Jacob, uh, Abraham Isaac, and and uh, Rachel are the father of, so it's like it's like this is or this is the family of Israel giving birth like their significance and what's interesting is that in Revelation chapter 12 we see that that same woman with the sun and the top of page five the same woman with the sun the moon and the 12 stars give birth to a male child clearly pointing to Jesus, who is caught up to God and his throne, clearly the ascension of Jesus to the throne. Okay, so it looks really clear that the woman of Revelation 12 is not Mary, it's Israel. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of people just miss that, but it's obvious. It's interpreting Scripture with Scripture. Israel gives birth to to the male child. And it looks like I didn't have a space there between the word above the line, all the feasts. Another way you can see the connection of Israel to the stars and the fact that God has given them some kind of, some kind of status here, some kind of identity. I don't know what status is probably not right, identity. Um, is the fact that all the feasts are essentially God's gifts to Israel. Gentiles are not required to keep Passover. Jews are required to keep Passover. Right? Gentiles are not required to keep Shavuot. Jews are required to keep Shavuot. They are gifts to Israel. And they are all connected to the stars. Because they're all related to the calendar. And the calendar is based upon the moon and the sun. Not entirely only the moon. The biblical calendar is not a perfectly lunar calendar. Islam has a perfectly lunar calendar. And that's why Ramadan will move throughout the years, throughout different seasons. The biblical calendar is a solely lunar calendar. It's tied to the sun, primarily to the moon, but also to the sun, which is why Passover always falls in the spring. So the sun is not ignored. So the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, you can see Israel's connection here. Gen in Genesis chapter 1, verse 4 um, Jared read it to us. We saw it it's part, every, every time when we do Havdalah. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided, the root word for Havdalah right there, the light from the darkness. Well, in Genesis 1.14, we find that same word for divide. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for there's the word Moadeh, or Moadim, or Moed, the word for feasts. So the feasts are directly tied to creation. And the Jewish people are required to keep them. And this is why God will say in Jeremiah 33, as long as there is a sun and a moon in the sky, there will always be and Israel before me. We exist. Psalm 19, verse 6. Nothing is hidden from the heat. It's obviously, they're referring to the sun because of the context there of the, of the passage of the psalm. It doesn't say nothing's hidden from the light. It says nothing's hidden from the heat. 
You could dig a hole deep enough and put yourself in a bunker and completely close all the windows and hide from the light of the sun. You could be in a completely dark spot. But no matter where you go on the planet, you cannot hide from the warming effect that the sun has on everything on this planet. Nothing is hidden from this heat. It's a principle. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse, and in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. You can't run from that principle. I will bless those, the plurality of those who bless you, and him, the singularity, who curses you I will curse. I will make the blessing big, I'll make the curse little. But the fact that he goes from, uh, from um, I'll bless those, plurality, to individual, singular, and then he says, and then you will all the family, means he literally does mean all. Because he went from plural to singular to all. No human being, family, can escape this principle. It is a principle that affects every family. A person can say, well, I brush my teeth, Pastor Robert's illustration, but I still smell, it doesn't work. Well, maybe you need to wear deodorant. It's a principle that affects every person. And so it is with not only the principle of deodorant or brushing your teeth, but this principle of that God built into creation this blessing. So I can't believe I'm bold enough to talk like this about this, but <laughs> I got to do it. <laughs> so. Um, Psalm 19, verse 4, their line has gone throughout the whole earth and their words to the end of the world. Um, in them he set a tabernacle for the sun. This is kind of interesting. The sun is housed in a tabernacle, the word ohel. Rash, Rashi, one of the most significant, probably the most significant Bible commentator in the last, I'll say, since the Bible, post-Bible, in terms of like, significance and respect for what he wrote within Judaism. That's probably, that's probably him, Rashi. So if you go to Safaria um, online, Rashi's the big, like the most significant person there, and you'll see it there. Okay, so um, he points out that the sun is placed within a case and that the sun's case is the sky above the atmosphere. And that sky, the atmosphere, is the thing that prevents the sun from burning up the whole world. And we have an ozone layer. And if the ozone layer burns away, we have problems. He said this a thousand years ago. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Psalms 19, verses 5 and 6, he said, the, the, David said, The sun is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoicing like a strong man running to its race. And it, it's rising from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. So the sun is compared, in verse 5, to a groom that comes out of his chamber with great joy. He's coming out of his chamber, a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. This is a happy person. <laughs> and when the circuit of the sun comes to an end, so the sun is bright because he's happy, and when the circuit of the sun comes to the end in verse 6, what does it do? It expects to return to its bride chamber again. And that's why it's happy. <laughs> and it will come out tomorrow shining again. It's also compared to a strong man, a warrior who's headed out on a race, confident of the fact that he is going to have victory. Now, I don't know that I'm actually going to get into the best part of the psalm, which is point two on page seven, because this, the rest of this stuff on verse, I just love this stuff in verse six, or on, uh, up, to, up to verse six. I love the whole psalm. Like I said, this is one of my favorite psalms and always has been. Because all truth is God's truth. And when I see something and I know that's true, for me, that's like, that's 
like reading Bible. I know that's true. You see the point? Now, if the Bible contradicts what I thought was true, then obviously what I thought was true is wrong because the Bible's always right. <laughs> Bible's always right. The way I interpret science may not be. But in Psalms 19, verse 1, it opens with this idea now that the firmament shows his handiwork. And I think about the fingerprints of God at this point. And you've heard me talk about this. I, uh, uh, that, 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 that there's these fingerprints on our lives. And so for the sake of this, I actually started to just write out some of the things that have gone on in my life where the dates just seem to be like crazy, least like coincidental. November 12th, my in-law's anniversary. 13th, my anniversary. 14th, my birthday. 15th, my eldest grandson's birthday. They, so literally, if we stay up to midnight, we end my birthday and start his. The 19th, my twins are born. The 20th, my eldest daughter is born. The 21st, my youngest son is born. So I have four kids born within 24 hours or having birthdays within 24 hours. You can't, you can't over, over four, five years, you can't, you can't, six years, you can't, you can't make that happen. My stepfather's birthday is in November. Our firstborn son begat his firstborn son on Rosh Hashanah in the town, in actually the Air Force Base in Minnesota, where he was conceived 23 years earlier. And when I think of that, I think about how Abraham sent his servant to Padan Aram to go get his daughter, a daughter-in-law for his, a daughter for uh, a wife for his son. I just, this is, my son ends up in his Padan Aram at Minot Air Force Base and as a kid in the place where he was conceived 23 years earlier. And then he has his, on Rosh Hashanah, and then he has his firstborn daughter on Israel's Independence Day. Don and I both joined the Air Force on the exact same day. She from Louisiana, me from Minnesota. We met at, at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii, which is the closest thing to heaven on earth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my father died when he was 53. I didn't know him. Donna's father died when he was 53. I served as the lead pastor of my last church for 16 years to the day. My granddaughter, Priscilla, my youngest grandchild, it occurred to me today, I never thought about it until today. Today, I thought, I realized it. My youngest grandchild's birthday was born on the anniversary of the day that I said, I'm not doing drugs anymore. That's the day she, I, 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 today I, I said, Mike, do I have this right? Her birthday is December 22nd. I said, yeah. And she's my youngest grandchild, right? Yep. That's the day I gave up drugs. <laughs> and the child before that, grandchild before that, was born on the anniversary of my salvation. You can't make these things up. And so if God puts his fingerprint, and I, I put that there because I really want you, that none of these things are significant except for in the joy of knowing that God has his hand on my life. And, he, and I want you to do the same. I want, see, I think about this. I want you to think about this. Because you will think of things. And it may not be dates like this. It may be something else. It, but the, the, you will think of things. And what they mean is God has his hand on your life. That's all it means. That's all it has to mean. What else could be more important than that? Right? I'm not going to use it to, like, make a decision about where I'm going to go to school or whatever. That's not the point. The point is God's in my life. That's the point. And the same way God can be on my life, he's on your life. And the same way God could be on as individual lives, I think it's interesting that in Genesis 10, we find these names, Gomer and Magog and Tubal and Meshes. These are names right at the beginning of creation. And we find those, some of those same names now mentioned in Ezekiel 38, where in 39, where you have this last day's war. And you find the same names mentioned in Revelation 20, after the millennia, when there's another war. It's like families 
And nobody's locked into that. I mean, I was not locked in. I made a decision for Yeshua, and he pulled me out of what I was in, and he gave me this gift of a life that I have. Nobody's locked in. Everybody who's a descendant of Gog and Magog is not going to hell. <laughs> Everybody, that's not the way it works. Everybody who has Yeshua, no matter where you're from, is going to heaven. Everybody. He's the whole kit and caboodle. He's everything. It's Yeshua. He's what counts. And so, and you can, and, and, but, but God has his hand on families. You can see that there. So I put this little thing there, a little description of something called a genogram. Does anybody here know what a genogram is? Just a, two or three hands. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I, I've done this with, every time I've done a wedding, I, I shouldn't say that, every time I've done premarital counseling, since I've been a gateway, I don't do premarital counseling. I've done some weddings, but Gateway has a ministry that does premarital counseling. But for 16 years, I was a lead pastor. Before that, I was an associate pastor. So this is a genogram. You take a person, say, I did this with my son Jeff um, when he was getting married to Crystal. And so I said, let's just, it just helped me to get to know you. And so you just kind of say to a person, okay, so you do a man with a square and you do a woman with a circle. That's a gender. It's the start. Okay, so here we are, and we do this, and there's me. That's really simple, right? There's me. Okay, and then I could say, here's Donna. It's really simple. And then you could say, these two people are going to get married. Almost 40 years. You all can see this, right? Okay. Okay, and now I'm, this is me, but I'm not the oldest. I actually have an older sister. So I'll put her over there because she's older. We have no other kids. And so now she is a widow. Uh, and is in a relationship. It's not really marriage, but they've been together for many years. My sister is borderline mentally retarded. She's got an IQ of 77, which I find really, um, really interesting because, okay, so my IQ, I remember from high school, the day when we were told this, my IQ is not that high, but it's 124. And hers is 77. And average is 100. So she's 23 below, and I'm 24 above. And that difference has made a huge difference in every area of our lives. And it will really help you get a picture of humility in life. Can you see that? Because we're essentially, anyway, just this kind of stuff will help you think. This, so, so this is, and my, sis, my, my wife, Donna, she is the oldest. So what would happen is over here is her sister, and then her brother, that's a square, and then another brother. And then you could, and you start to, and then you start to ask questions like, does anybody have any sicknesses? Anybody have any marriage concerns? Anybody have any, like, my son, my fourth born, he'd be one, two, three, four, fourth born here. My fourth born's wife, when I did this, so she's got, she's one of ten siblings. Her mother has kids from, I think it's four or five men. You would think that my daughter-in-law would be a person who has no real connection to the significance of family. She is the exact opposite of everybody in our family. She is the one that works the most at making sure there is family. 
She did the exact opposite. It, she did not let it create a problem. She used it to make strength. She is remarkable. I wish she could see this right now. But Crystal is remarkable. So you just start to ask questions. And what it does is it helps you know how to pray. You're not locked. She wasn't locked into something. I wasn't locked into something. You're not locked into anything. You're free. But it helps you understand. And this is who I am and where I'm coming from. Right? It's who you are and where you're coming from. And so this whole genogram thing is fantastic. And can you believe it's 510? And all I did was the part of the psalm that's just like, oh, yeah, God speaks through creation. But you know what? God really speaks through the word. <laughs> and, uh, but but I, I had this feeling I was going to do that. And I... If I was really wanting to risk it a little bit, but I didn't want to do it, I would have pulled somebody out of the class, and I would have said, let's do your family. <laughs> you might not have liked that publicly. <laughs> but it is, it's fun. It's just fun. It's, you get to know who you are. And you can do this yourself. And I encourage you, look at, um, look at the latter part of this a lot. You know, just kind of just go through it, and um, and and uh, let me just uh, let me just go, look at page ten. I'll just close close with this. Page ten. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. This is the cool thing I think that's about that. Our problem is is. I wrote that, that. It should have said, I'm sorry. Our problem is not that our sins are too small to be seen. I'm going to say it again. Our problem is not that our sins are too small to be seen. Our problem is that they're too characteristic of who we really are so that we don't even recognize them. That's the issue. That's what David's saying. I can't believe I messed that up there. Our problem is not that our sins are too small to be seen. Our problem is they're really who we are. We just don't even see them. And that's what David is saying. And that's why something like this can actually be helpful. That's my problem. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? But on Shavuot, God wrote his law. On tablets of stone, Ten Commandments. And then in Acts 2, according to Jeremiah 31, on Shavuot, on the same day, he wrote his Ten Commandments on the hearts of people. That's the beauty of it. Praise God.